Right, I take you back to a sunny afternoon on the 22nd of June, 1996, when I was a, a 12-year-old little weasel, and as you'd expect at a posh boarding school where we weren't allowed to watch the Euro 96 quarterfinal, probably because of a Latin lesson. So the morning of the game against Spain, I blagged my way into sick bay. I pulled the wool over the eyes of the, the troll-like matron who resembled Miss Trunchbull and kicked back in front of the screen to see England pull Spanish pants down where Psycho got redemption from the penalty spot as he punched the Wembley air six years after a heartbreak against the Germans. And in the words of his favourite band, The Stranglers, too many teardrops for one heart to be crying, too many teardrops for one heart to carry on. You're going to cry 96 tears. Welcome to Out of Your League, a man who made 746 Premier League appearances, 78 England caps along the way as well, a former Manchester City manager and the guy who took Great Britain to the 2012 Olympics as well. More importantly, a Warrington Wolves fanatic. John and Mark, put your hands together for Mr Stuart Pearce. Thank you very much. <laughs> I've just got a vision of you at boarding school now. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not, not a good, good. It's not a good one. <laughs> no, no. We don't want to dig. Don't want to dig too deeply into that, Stuart. We'll leave that where it is. You know. No, no, I'll leave that with him. <laughs> Stuart, honestly, it's so exciting to have you on. We've been trying to get you for a while, so thank you so much. And I know you're a you're a busy man, so really good to to have you for an hour or so. Um, look, first up, how has a soft southern fairy like you fallen in love with rugby league? Um, well, obviously, I knew my limitations and I see a sport that I didn't have the physical prowess to be involved in, you know, because I'm too much of a coward. And I, it was probably a couple of chance meetings, really. Uh, first one was Steve McNamara Mark come to Wembley when I was the under 21s manager and uh, he was the England manager at the time. Um, probably more importantly for me, um, Tony Smith was presenting on the footballing pro, pro licence. Um, and I went along to see him present with a perception of an Aussie rugby league coach that was blown out the water by the presentation that he gave. You know, he was quite softly spoken, uh, very thought out in, in his reasoning behind everything that he'd done. And since then, really, we sort of become friends. I went up to watch him set the team up, Warrington. I've been on pre-season training with them. Um, just got hooked on the club, but Tony was probably my main introduction into rugby league. I love this, Stuart. So you still do these nine-hour round trips to watch Warrington Wolves, don't you? I mean, that is commitment to the cause. It's mental. <laughs> it is. I'll tell you what, when you're stuck on the M6 northbound on the 29th, it, you do question yourself and, and you've lost by the odd point against Wakey or whatever and you're on your way home at... 12, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, you do wonder. But listen, we go, I mean, prior to going into work at West Ham, I would have a look at the fixtures and sort of almost try and work my life around Warrington's fixtures, whether it be home or away. I'm really fortunate that the, the board of directors there, Mike Lomax and Simon and Stuart, look after me brilliantly. So if we're away from home any time, we'll normally go and sit with the directors and they look after us well. But... Listen, I defy anyone uh, not to get hooked on rugby league. It's such a good sport. And, and what attracted you to the to the sport um, to begin with, Stuart? Um, I've got to be honest. The profession I'm involved in now, at times I despair. Players going to ground too cheaply, trying to con the referee. Um, the angst between reporters in football. And I go and watch a rugby league game. And in the main, the fans, you know, they're united no matter what team you, you represent. Reporters in football. And I go and watch a rugby league game. And in the main, the fans, you know, they're united no matter what team you, you represent. They're great camaraderie amongst the fans. The honesty amongst the players I find is fantastic. You know, they go hell for leather for 80 minutes. And at the end of the game, in the main, you know, that there's a real camaraderie between both teams. The South Sea Islanders go to the middle and pray. The teams win, lose or draw, walk round the perimeter of the pitch, take photographs with young children. And I sit in the stand and and I'm almost amazed by it and, and think this is what professional sport at the highest level should be, you know. And on top of that, you've got the product of the game itself. You've got to be quick. You've got to be strong. You've got to be able to be dexterous with your hands 
You've got to be clever with your feet. It, it's an all-round sport, really, that, that I enjoy the technical side of it as well. Has Tony taught you some of the te- technical aspects as well? No, I'm, I'm almost a, a rugby brain dead, if I'm being honest with you. I go and I've got loyalties to one club at the moment. Obviously, uh, I know the back end of this year, England, and we try and get to as, as many games as I can with them. Um, and I know what good play is and what bad play is, but I almost watch it in, in quite a naive manner. Scratch. I think if you've played, I used to play rugby union at school, but never rugby league. So I think the technicalities of the game are lost on me slightly, but I'm almost learning as I go along long pick the brains of people alongside me at games as well to find out you know some of the technicalities of the game I know you find rugby league Stuart quite refreshing in that sense the the sort of the honesty and the integrity of the sport and look you've been involved in football your your whole life and can you see a a contrast there very much so um I I think in some, some way as well there's been a criticism of football which I find quite sad that Football's going away from the fans. And I think that the one big plus in rugby leagues, I see the togetherness between the fans and, and the rugby players, especially. I like that. I think that's really refreshing. Um, if, if I throw open, I've been asked to be an ambassador for Mossy, and I know you had him on a couple of weeks ago, um, and his foundation. But I see how rugby comes together for the likes of Mossy and Rob Burrow and that type of thing. And that's something that I find really refreshing, that real honesty and that togetherness. There's almost, if we have a tough time collectively as a sport, I really like that about the sport. What I love here, John, as well, is that when Warrington had been playing Saints over all of these years, you probably had no idea that Stuart Pearce was in the stands saying, fucking Wilkin, you fucking (laughs) Wilkin. I think I heard him a couple of times. Um, (laughs) Hey, you would have heard me at the Challenge Cup final. There'd be a lot of people saying that, though. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's not it's not a very unique standpoint. There's a, there'd be a lot of that going on, Will. But yeah, no. Um, yeah, I think Stuart's appraisal of the game is actually really interesting because we're all in danger because we have, uh, you aside, Will, we've got very similar sort of thoughts on the game. And, and, and I think sometimes in life, actually, the naive eye o- over a problem is, is sometimes the best. And, and the best appraisal of a, a complicated situation can come from a naive perspective. So... Stuart's uh, love of the game or that developed love of the game from a naive viewpoint is actually a big learning for the sport, I think, because we talk almost in an echo chamber about how we see the sport and, and how all of the people within the game see the sport. But when you hear somebody come from who, who has an elite mindset from a different sport come in and go, wow, you know, this sport is special. I think that that in itself is is is, is huge and and. I think it's a reminder, actually, sometimes uh, we need eyes from outside of the sport to remind us of what's good, but also to instigate some innovation to create, you know, new sort of benchmarks. And I think we've always gone to the NFL as, as a sport, as rugby league has always used the NFL to, to look to innovate. Well, it seems bizarre that we've got football, you know, our, our closest sort of, I'd say, working class team sport in this country and I believe there's a lot of learning that can go the other way and and that that cross of sports where you get football and rugby league and if rugby league can teach maybe football the integrity that is lost that connection with the fans then maybe uh, you know rugby league can learn an awful lot from football in terms of the commerciality of it you know the the understanding of the the tv deals and and all of that so I think there's this huge crossover and it's just exciting to hear a man who's been hugely successful himself say great things about a sport that we often probably don't view in such glowing terms. So it's, it's good to hear. I mean, I'll just go back to some of, some of the life experiences I've had. Uh, in 2014, when I took over at Nottingham Forest as manager, first thing I'd done was send my two conditioning coach to Warrington Wolves, you know, to pick up some ideas from there. Two years ago, when, when I was working at West Ham, Tony Smith come down to me had four days at West Ham and the only thing I asked Tony to do was go around as many departments as he possibly could at our club and just give me that sort of almost naive viewpoint. And sometimes the most, Tony's quite astute, I believe, you know, he understands what a a great sporting environment looks like. Um, And some of the feedback he gave me was brilliant. It's the feedback that I couldn't have got from with inside football because of that naive why do you do it like that question? You know, that 
probably, if you're involved in football or, or, or side of the game in rugby league, you wouldn't ask the question because it sounds so basic. But some of the feedback I got from Tony was outstanding. And I would say to anyone, get a set of eyes from outside your sport that, that you value to come in and almost critique your sport. And it done me personally a great deal of favours. And it's certainly done our, our football club a lot of favours. I think that's you know really interesting. I, I read a book recently by Matthew Said, uh, Rebel Ideas, and, and he outlines in that book uh, a lot of what you're saying. And, and I think in, in elite sporting environments, if your sphere of understanding, you know, mine and Mark Flanagan's sphere of understanding might be just 2 or 3% different from each other. But when you get eyes from another sport that has nothing in common with you, the learning to be had there is incredible. Like that's an exciting thing to, to uh, and it's, I think what Matthew Saeed calls it is, is, is having an outsider's perspective but an insider's mentality. So, you, you know, you've, you're, you're inside of a problem or, or a sport and, and you absolutely immerse yourself in it. But then taking yourself one removed and, and try and think from somebody from that naive perspective. When you said that word, naive rugby fan, I thought there's so much that can be learned from that perspective. And we, I think one of the things, one of my frustrations is we probably don't listen to the naive perspective about our sport enough, good or bad, you know, both. I think we can learn a huge amount from from that perspective. Stuart, you're you're known obviously to everyone uh, who, do, who probably doesn't really know you that well as one of football's hard men. I know you're a bit of a, a softy deep down. Where did that all start? Where did Psycho come from? Where did all this this imagery start beginning? Um, well, listen, let me. Uh, I started nowhere to go and play football at the age of sixteen. I'd left school. Um, we had a decent school team. I had nowhere to go and play, play uh, professional sport. Was it a pipe dream? So I went to my local club. And bear in mind, I had two and a half years in, in the non-league setup before I turned pro at 21. And in the environment I used to play in, I was probably not in way or form perceived as someone who was particularly tough. There was a lot of ex-pros there. I was probably the only player in, in my team um, that had never had a, had a connection with a pro club in his, in his career. Everyone else was coming down the leagues from the pro game. And make no mistake about this, I used to have the shit kicked out as a kid. But you learn to toughen up quickly, you know. So after 250 games, going all over the country to play games against some real tough old pros, you get to, not, to look after yourself in many ways. And probably going into the pro game, the perception that, that people had of me was someone that was quite aggressive, the way I played, that type of thing. But it, it almost become, I mean, it was, it was Chris and Psycho at Not in the Forest by the fans, but it almost become a bit of a theatre, really, you know. I played up to it on the pitch to make my life a little bit easier. And, you know, I see that in, in the rugby league world. You, you, you might threaten to do something that's quite aggressive and then all of a sudden go somewhere else, you know. And it almost become like that with myself, really. If, if I could be sledging a, a naive winger verbally to, to make him think that I'm going to do something aggressive, all of us is eye off controlling the ball. So it was something that, you know, I ended, ended up in, in my whole career playing about a thousand matches. And in those thousand games, I only ever got sent off sent five times. And that isn't the, the disciplinary record of someone you call psycho or someone with an aggressive attitude. It's someone who plays with their head. So I used to play up to a level and utilise a nickname and utilise a reputation, but probably I'll never use that reputation if I needed to. Otherwise, you know, we'll play your strongest card if you don't have to at any given time. And do you think you got the better opponents with 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 the um, the character that people made of you? Do you think you got the better of them by intimidating them for the, the carrots that you made? Because we see often in boxing that some boxers are beaten before they enter the ring because their opponent is so aggressive or has such a, an aggressive reputation. Do you think on some occasions you got the better of people before you'd even stepped on the pitch? Yeah, I, I think a reputation went before me that sometimes it was it was a right reputation. It wasn't, but I always, I always looked at it like this. I would take people... If if I thought physically intimidating them or verbally intimidating them on a pitch was going to make my life easier, I would do that. If we had a physical and they were a lot stronger than I was, 
it will be a footballing uh, a, a match of football. I wouldn't take them on at their strengths if I didn't have to. I'd find another way. And I think the cutest players in any sport, world level, international level, or even club level, you know, if you're Rob Burrow and you think you're going to take Murdoch Masilla on a physical battle, you're going to be sadly mistaken. But he'll use his head and play to his own strengths. That's common sense, you know, and that's what sensible players do. And that's probably what I did. I think as well, Stuart, one thing there you're saying about um, the understanding of psychology of, of, of distracting an opponent, you know, to some extent. And, and, and I believe, you know, in a game, you know, we talk a lot about players who are in the zone or you're in the moment. And, and I, I reckon that's where your 100% of your mental capacity is focused on on what you're doing, and 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 I've used um, sledging strategically throughout my career, um, good and bad. I got it wrong, I got, I got it right sometimes. But what I perceived from the benefit of sledging an opponent was if you can divert five percent of their attention over there instead of being on the game, it get, puts you in an advantageous position. Uh, I'll give you an example. We, we I think I've told this story before. We kicked off to Wigan. And Stuart Fielding was renowned as a strong ball carrier, but I, I would sledge him from out wide. I had no me, I could not tackle him. He was not going to get to me, you know, through that thing. But I sledged him for a few, few times, and then next thing he's changing his course of run to try and get to me, and 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 it, the net effect of that was we're going to end up in a less advantageous position on the field for us to beat. You know, we went on and beat them. It's not just because of that, but you can use, you know, I, I'd say sledge and use words use body language, are all like weapons that, that sports people need to understand. You saying Bolt, like, look at him at the start of 100 metres. you telling me that's anything other than trying to intimidate other athletes. That's all he's doing. He is strutting around, puff, chest puffed out, looking relaxed, speaking in a relaxed manner, you know, giving his shoes to the person who looks after his kit behind him. And all of that is a distraction. You know, there's runners next to him are thinking, how is he this relaxed? You know, how is he this confident? And yeah, I, I love it when sports people, I think cricket use sledging, you know, the most intense sort of use of it you can you can see in cricket. But but there's certainly lots of it in rugby league. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad there's, there was lots of it in football. I'm not sure. Is there still, Stuart, or not? No, I, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure players know how to do it. If I'm being quite honest with you, but it's almost talked about from yesteryear as as a badge of honour. Nowadays, it's talked to as a as a sort of slur. But I think it goes hand in hand with, with your strength on a pitch. All you're doing is building yourself up and setting yourself up for elite performance. And someone asked me a, a while back, what's the difference between, between a player and an international player? It's mental strength, I think. You know, you're prepared. When things are tough, just to dig deep or understand why they're going wrong and and how to deal with that. But certainly, you know, the mental tools of of, of our professions um, they play such a big part in in sport. I look at you know groups of players I work with. You know, they've all got different characteristics, but it's the ones that can bounce back from a bit of adversity. You know, are going to overachieve in their careers. Stuart, I was reading a little bit about you, and um, look, everyone always thinks. For people who don't know, particularly know you that well or, or know much about football, they, all, they will always think back to the, the 1990 penalty miss and the 1996 redemption, as we kind of touched on at the top. But I remember you saying that you played for England with hate as a bit of a motivation and you played with anger. Did, did that come as a result of, of the, the criticism that we got for that, that penalty miss in 1990? And I'm thinking back to, you know, that was a long time ago, well before social media was knocking about and probably well before if it happened these days you'd, you'd have got f- some nasty stuff some death threats some also you know i mean you, people get footballers get death threats for for nothing these days so imagine what it would have been like for a penalty missing the semi-final of a world cup how did you deal with all that at the time and and was that a result of you playing like that um I think for me, I, I've got to say at the time, bear in mind, we were, you know, off of a billion people watching on telly and it was my first tournament ever for England and we're in a World Cup semi-final, you know, we were a stone's throw away from getting to, to a final and potentially being World Cup winners. So to have, you know, end up sort of missing a penalty for England and, and all that that went with, with it. The following season was my best season um, as a footballer. 
all because I had missed a penalty a couple of months previous in, in the pre-season for England. And it was that mental attitude to spring back. And, and in some ways now, looking back at it, yes, I wish I would have scored a penalty, but it taught me so many life lessons, uh, how to react, uh, stupid little things like I got drawn out to do the drug test right after that penalty miss, walked into a room and was sat in a room two German players that had just won a World Cup semi-final and myself for hours. We had to give a urine sample before we left. They sat oh opposite God. me. Well, it's probably the worst case scenario you could ever think of. But out of it, they sat there and not did not say a word to each other for the two hours. We just sat there. I sat with my head bowed. They just sat there in total silence. And it taught me a really good lesson of how to be humble as well in victory. And I thought to myself afterwards when I was, you know, got my head out my arse a little bit, I thought, what would that have been like with two English players and one German if we had won the semi-final? Could we have been that humble? You know, so there's really great lessons to be learned. And for me, the best lessons can only be learned, not only, but in the main, your focus is sharpened in adversity or defeat. They're the times you should go back and you analyse everything to the nth degree. And if you've got anything about you, your performance improves accordingly. I'm just wondering, Stuart, what that, that felt like, though. Did, did you feel the, the hate of a nation? Because that is quite a burden to have on, on at the time, young shoulders. Listen, it, if I miss a penalty and England don't go through a tournament, they feel it as much as I do. You know, the, in rugby league terms, if you like, hopefully I'll be in a few of the stadiums for, for England's games later in this year. And I remember, was it um, New Zealand beat us in the semi final at Wembley a few years ago? England, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I believe, you know, and I, I can honestly tell you, I've never felt so hollow at Wembley in my whole life as that last couple of seconds and the point that went over the, over the law, you know, that, that knocked us out that day. It's unbelievable and that's not my sport but I'm looking there and I'm thinking I know how you feel boys boys are there you know and uh, I I think listen it's like all, all sports you have your highs I, I'm always a bit dubious about people patting me on the back and telling me how good I am or how good a performance was I think sometimes when people tell you you're crap you know where you stand you know and I think I'm a different animal to a lot of people, potentially, but I think a lot of top sports people, sometimes, somewhere down the line, they, they, you know, they know how to, to, to come back from adversity. And have you always had that um, in your part of your personality to come back to, from adversity? Um, Will referenced earlier, you came through the lower leagues, and do you think that standing uh, and that journey of, of coming through the lower leagues, play, being an electrician, doing it the tough way, do you think that moulded you for the better to be able to come back from adversity that you met in your career? 100%. I think, um, you know, as a 13-year-old boy, I was at my local club, Queen's Park Rangers, and got released after six months and then never got the two jobs. I wanted to join the army or the police and failed both interviews at the age of 16. Um, and it's a catalogue of things as well, missing penalties, broke my leg as a 37-year-old player and come back from that and broke it again five months later and come back from that. And if, I, if I'd if i have been a golden child that, that come to an academy and was told how good I was, I see so many young players now that they never suffer adversity until probably the age of 18, 19, where professional clubs tell them, sorry, you haven't made the grade, you know, and they just can't handle, they've not got the mentality, let alone potentially the ability to come back from it and say, say I'll show you, you know. And I think I'm not, not sure how much we prepare our young players for that day when adversity might come knocking at any sport. I really don't. You know, yes, we have to tell who we are and I understand that. But at times we've got a duty of care as coaches as well to tell them one or two hard facts that are going to help them out in the. Yeah, self-esteem, um, I believe, is actually at the, at the moment it is as fake as it's ever been for, for young people at times. It's built on, you know, um, attention, adulation from sources that, you know, you, you, you don't need to hear positive or negative things from. And when that self-esteem, I believe it, it becomes really brittle and you need an experience, you need adversity in your life to almost harden the soft shell that's around you. And, and 
you know, Stuart's story is, 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 is points of adversity and then a, a steely grit to get over it. And that, I think that word for me is something I think a lot about is grit, you know, and, and, the, and it's overcoming adversity, being tough, having self-esteem that's, that's that robust, it can deal with all the shit that life throws at you. Because if you're really honest with the younger athletes who are coming into sport and want to play sport, it's fucking hard. It's hard work and, and, and it's going to kick you in the nuts every time, you know, two or three times a year. It's going to it's going to treat you badly. And if you aren't ready to deal with that, it'll ca- it'll catch you out and it wastes maybe the time of a club who've developed an athlete to a point, but not tested his self, you know, his, his resilience, tested his self-esteem. And, 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 you know, I think we've got a long way to understand the balance between the soft guiding hand of a great coach and the firm hand of an old school coach. And and I came up through the middle, right down the middle of this sort of, this time where I was from an old school coaching background, you know, really harsh coaching background, which, you know, I'm very interested in talking and thinking about. And then came into an environment where I was an aging athlete, an environment that very much was about making sure everybody felt good and positive and was about a developing your young athletes. So that time, that space, if, if we could go back in time now, Stuart, 20, 30 years into a dressing room, you know, let's maybe say to the to the, the Brian Clough era part of your career, it just wouldn't, it, it, it wouldn't survive, would it? It'd be blasted out of the water. No, cer- certain things certainly wouldn't. But I, I look at Cluffy and you, you brought the name up. He was probably one of the psychologists we've got somebody in in our buildings now that has got a name tag as a psychologist in, in sporting environments i think in years years gone he was one of the first ones he would always ground you if he thought you were above your station in many ways but i tell you what there's been a, a number of days where you're on the floor and, and he, he sees that and gives you a lift when you least expect it you know and i think there's a lot to be, to be learned there it, it's not one size fits all and i always I always quantify what I say to people. And often if I'm going in into a room to give feedback back on performance or whatever uh, at our club, I always ask another coach to coach him with me to, to just listen and scan the room. When you're talking to people like I am as a coach, sometimes I've got the eye contact of, of certain individuals, but you don't see what other individuals, their facial expressions, all of those type of things. And I think you're right what you say. There's a balance to be had somewhere that that path that you've taken where you have to be honest with people, give them an honest assessment, especially young players. But you also as well to find a way of wording things. I'm I'm a lot softer now, probably than when I first started going in, into the coaching world. That is without a doubt. But it's not about me. It's about them and me getting a performance out of them. I think if I'm too soft at any given time, it's not helpful to them. And if I'm too hard, it's not helpful to them. And the only thing that matters is them. It's not me as a coach anymore. And it's understanding that. Yeah, I think what Stuart's mentioning there is, is, is like emotional intelligence. It's understanding those people around you and understanding how you speak and how you act and how, how that affects them. And I think the best way of developing that is is life skills and, and going out there and whether it's working as a sparky or, or a building site for a few years. And I think the amount of experiences, the amount of people that you meet mould you. And I, I think, um, as we referred to before, Brian Clough, he wouldn't have had the same lifespan that a Jose Mourinho as a top line manager would have because they're so far removed from, from day-to-day life and society that they can't have the same experiences. And I think, you know, we talk about professional sport and young people the amount of times that they're mollycoddled in academies or scholarships and they don't get to experience real life, I think that's the one hindrance that they'll get as they grow older. And it'll be one hindrance that will affect the amount of leaders and senior players and people that will carry on the, the legacy of, of that kind of that emotional intelligence and getting the best out in people. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Also, I look at my own profession as well and, and I... I'm sometimes very critical how much we develop leadership as well. You know, if people ask me about teams that I played in that, that, that achieved stuff that were quite good, 
I would say you probably look around the dressing room and it was probably at least five really strong leaders. You know, my the team that I played in in 96 had Gareth Southgate, who's gone on to manage England, Tony Adams and various other players that are all strong leaders and strong personalities. And I think somewhere down the line, all sports have, have got to do a little bit more, 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 develop leadership within the ranks. Stuart, you're having an impact now on players at, at West Ham, you know, and other clubs you've been at that coaches would have had the same impact on you. And and you mentioned Brian Clough. Tell everyone the story about Brian Clough when you were called into the England squad for the first time and you went into to Cloughy's office and what he said to you. Well, I mean, I was picked to play for England in, in 87. Bear in mind, I was 25 years old at the time and four years previous to that, I was an electrician in Brent Council where Wembley's housed. So I was nervous as a kid, and I've got to say, um, I knew I'd be playing um, because Kenny Sanson, the recognised left back, was injured and missing both games. The games that we had were, were brilliant at Wembley, 100,000 people in Scotland away at Hamden. So if you're going to make, make a national bell, they don't get much bigger than those two. Uh, and so I was basically, you're thinking, am I good enough to be in this level and this standard of the play? And I went in the next day after being picked and a young apprentice come down to the dressing room and said to me, um, the manager wants to see you in his office. So I walked down to his office and on the way I thought he was going to offer me a new contract or, or congratulate me on being picked for England for the first time. And he, he said, sit down, son. He said, I see you're in the England squad. I said, that's right, boss. He said, do you think you're good enough? I said, I'm not sure. He went, I don't fuck off. And that was the whole conversation. <laughs> Now, now, I got up, Brilliant. obviously thanked him for his kind words uh, and took his advice and done one. And to be honest with you, it was, he put in a message across to me. I was probably too thick and too naive at the time to realise the message he was putting across, which was keep your feet on the floor. And all of those type of things were obviously on his mind, you know, just managing my expectation. From my point of view, it's brilliant. What I got out of it was someone to prove wrong. From a nervous state of someone who's been picked to play for their country for the first time, not not sure whether I was good enough to actually achieve that. I walked out of that room and I said, Fuck you, I'll show you. And it was brilliant inspiration for me. He got what he wanted out of it. He delivered a message. Keep your feet on the floor. I got out of it almost this... Well, it don't matter. The nerves have gone. I've got someone to prove wrong. And I think that mentality of having someone to prove wrong has probably stood me in really good stead over my career, from being a, a non-league player, am I good enough to be a pro, um, to taking on the pros. Uh, and my mentality was, I've got to train, eat and sleep better than you because you've got more quality than me. And that proviso stuck with me all my career, basically right until I finished at the age of 40 years old as a player because I had that mentality. I always said I've got something to prove and it was brilliant psychology from Cluffy. We both got out of it what we wanted. Well, I'm not sure I did. I'm hoping for a few more quid, to be honest with you, out of him, but that was done. But it was an incredible conversation and it also taught me one thing as well. A manager said to me once when I was going into management, he said, be careful what you say to players. They'll remember every word you say to them. But what they say to you, you'll forget 99.9% of it. And it was so true. I can remember that conversation with Cluffy like it was yesterday. I remember every word of that conversation because he was my manager. If he had been my teammate, I'd have forgot it by now. And that stood me in good stead when I went into management and coaching as well. Be careful what you say to them. Think it through first. He got a great reaction from me, probably because he knew me inside out and knew me and knew my character and knew the reaction he was going to get incredible look i know one of your big quotes and you, uh, this this should be on the wall at west ham if it's not but just exactly on what you're saying failure is when you don't try something because you're fearful of what might happen uh, that's very true and it People ask me about taking this penalty at Wembley. Um, never put up to take it by the manager. I had to go to them to the mayor when we went into extra time and say to him, I'm taking the third one. And he looked at me and went, are you, are you sure? And I said, well, I was until you said, you said Terry, you know what I mean? So <laughs> and that, that, 
that mentality so probably stood me in really good stead. And I thought, looking back on it, I thought, what would my life and how I get viewed by people in football have been like if I stood on the halfway line and refused to walk up and take a penalty and allowed a lesser penalty taker to step up? And unfortunately, I'm in a position where I can influence youngsters and it's nice to be able to turn around and say, it's not walking up there and missing something. It's not having the mentality to go and at least try. That's the killer. And that, that is the killer in all, in all sports. When we see our teams out there or our teammates that are, are fearful of, of, of forming because of the consequences, I always put it in its perspective. What's the worst can happen? We get beat. Well, it's hardly the end of the world, you know? And that, that's the same in all sport. Fear is an interesting one for me because... Fear can like be a, a really strong headwind that stops you from performing, or it can be the wind in your sails that makes you go better. And I think harnessing like different emotions is different for everyone. I think we all get emotion, we all get motivation from from different sources. And 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 just like resonating with what Stuart said about, you know, maybe Nigel Clough's influence. You know, I remember when I signed for St. Helens, and Ian Millward was was like brutal with me to the point where he just told me to fuck off back to Hull like go get in your car leave you know in the middle of training sessions making me walk and stay, sit in the stands while the lads were training you know he, he must have told me to go get in my car and go home maybe four or five times and look it's easy for me to sit in now as a, as a 38 year old man and and, and I've rationalised it over time but the impact that had on me is that everything I did wanted to prove this guy wrong that he was wrong about me and and uh, and you know that that motivation, I, I think if, if you can harness negativity and and use it as fuel and not let it consume you, it's powerful. But you know that's a big challenge for anyone in life, isn't it? You 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 encounter something negative, you get a lot of negative feedback, and you know a lot of people change direction or change how they do things. And and I look back to that point in the embryonic sort of part of my career. And as cruel as it felt at the time, and as much like I'll be honest, you know, as I was devastated at the time, it just gave me this bit of fuel that other people didn't have around me, and I knew that that was coming from this insecurity of feeling like, you know, he didn't rate me as a player, so I wanted to prove him wrong. And there's something really powerful in that, you know, and I think we all we all can learn from that sort of stuff. I think there's a real challenge there for coaches and managers because it, it's all very well delivering the bombshells at times, but you've got to understand the person you're trying to motivate. And that's something that, that I try to get better at as, as, as time goes by. If I lose a young player because of my wording or my body language or whatever, I've committed the biggest crime that you could ever, could ever be coaching and management. I've stifled talent, you know. Now, me being abused, you being abused over time, if we spring back from it and it makes us stronger, I'll give the coach credit for knowing you and knowing me and knowing how we would react to those, those verbal slants and physical slants and being left out of the team. What we've got to make, certainly myself as a coach or if I go back into management, whatever I do, the, the next generation of, of talent is not stifled by anything that I say or do and that that, that, is, that is, is really critical and I think that's more important than probably me re reacting to some harsh words yesteryear you know. So Stuart when you stepped up in 96 then it was an iconic moment for the nation and you know that punch in in the air at Wembley told a, a million stories but how much of an iconic moment was it for you personally when you talk about adversity? Um I'll tell you every, every picture in sport, whether it be an Olympian on, on getting a gold medal or, or someone going over the try line in a grand final or whatever. And I'll say to that player, what does that mean to you? And tell me about the journey you've been on to get there. And that journey is all about injuries. It's about dedication. It's about a multitude of things. And people say to me, what was my emotions on that day scoring a penalty for England? as a 34-year-old, and I'll, I'll go back and talk to them about a year earlier when the England manager rung me up and said, you're not going to be in my plans with Graham Ramless or another left-back. And the phone went quiet, and he's expecting me to retire from international football at my age. 
And my only reaction, reaction was, you think I'm good enough to be in the squad, I'll fight for my place. And he went, oh, 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 obviously not expecting my answer. And for a year outside the team, um, being a bit part player for England and not getting back in until the April before the June that you mentioned earlier because of an injury. He broke his ankle, I got back in the team and I'm over, only ever remembered for that penalty. Now, it was the journey for a year, the selflessness and me putting myself up to play for England when it would have been easy down at my age. And that, that for me is the thing that I think of when I stay up and see that penalty or see a rerun of it what went before, the year that went before, and all sportsmen have to have it. The ones that achieve anything in life, they have to go out. Often their parents uh, have taken them to games and God knows what else. You've, you've got to dedicate your whole life to it to, just to get 15 seconds, but it's worth it. I think it's evident to a lot of a lot of sports people, like Stuart said, can resonate with that. I remember I, I had a similar experience. I, I had a really bad knee injury in 2013. Um, I tore my cruciate ligament and then the following season, I fought my way back to fitness to, to start the season. And the coach left me out when I was on dual registration and, and had to play for Rochdale in the league below. And it was the worst four weeks of my complete career. I was so down because I played for Rochdale, which were a much lower standard than I was used to. And later that year, we won the grand final with St. Helens. And when we won it, just like Stuart said then, all I could think about was earlier that season when I felt like packing in felt like drinking 10 cans of Stella every now and just night and forgetting all, all the reasons why I played rugby league. But I had this idea in my head that it would all change. And I think that resilience and that probably dogged mentality is is why I, I was able to, to, to be part of a team to win a grand final. And I think that's, like Stuart said, every every single athlete has those moments in their career. And it's fight or flight. And, and Stuart's alluded to a few situations this last half an hour of where he's had a decision to make where he can he can fight it or he can he can fly and he can take the easy option. I think that's that's the big message for me is 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 you always got to try and keep fighting and keep keep that same mentality going. And can I just tip my hat to, to your profession? Um it was probably about this time last year, I think, when Tony Smith said to me to me, I popped to the uh, the spinal um hospital in Wakey to see Mossy, you know, and I walked in there and to be fair because of what had happened to him and because of the situation, I was a little bit nervous. I'd never met Mossy before and I was a little bit nervous to have him there, but it was the right thing to do. And his talent absolutely blew me away. His positivity was incredible. He just talked about helping others in the unit, being in the gym. I'm going in the gym to help the others. And that mentality, I thought, wow. You know, everything. I walked out of the hospital. I thanked Tony for inviting me along uh, to see Mossy. And I thought that mentality, probably for me, in my eyes, with rugby league, that summed everything up to me. And I thought, if you can have that mentality two and a bit months after what's happened to you, then there's no excuse for anybody else in the world. You know, you've got to roll, roll, roll your sleeves up and come out fighting every day of your life. And the inspiration that he's given just me has been quite incredible. I know you've still got a, a good relationship with Gareth Southgate as well, Stuart. And I'm just thinking, and we all remember the pizza advert and so on. Having been through what he then went through in '96, how much did you did you help him, and has that helped him up until today? Um, listen, he, he was always a great leader. He was one of those individuals that we got on brilliantly. Didn't know each other club level, but we've got the same caring for our national team. Team, we've got the same caring for football. And we got the same professionalism to, to represent our countries, and that will never wane, you know. Um, and you know, so sometimes when when you've had a tough day at the office, and people say, "I know how you feel," when they don't know how you feel and got no perception of how you feel. Feel when Gareth missed a penalty in a semi final, and we sat across the dinner table back at the hotel afterwards, and we had a couple of drinks. The tournament, and we were out, and I said to him, "I know how you feel." Um, he, he looked at me and went. You know what? You do know how I feel. You've been there. But his reaction to adversity is there for all to see. He's he's a very strong character, but he's probably got a reputation of, of being sort of maybe a, a lighter, softer character, if you like. He's well thought out. He's well spoken. But to be fair, he's got that, that hard nosed about him that says, I'm going to bounce back from adversity. And he's done exactly the same. Look, Stuart, we've kept you a long time, so I'm going to finish off with some quick-fire questions for you. 
Um, and the first one, you've got no time to think about these. First one, what's your favourite cheese? Cheddar. Uh, who'd win in a fight, you or Roy Keane? Roy Keane. How long would the fight last? As long as I wanted it to, really. <laughs> <laughs> would you have lived the rest of your life without your index finger to have scored that penalty against West Germany in 1990? Uh, if, I would, if it would have guaranteed us victory and a World Cup victory a game later, yes. First word in your head <laughs> right you now, you your country. <laughs> Say that again. Stuart, first word in your head right now. Stranglers. <laughs> celebrity, celebrity crush. Be careful because the, the missus is nearby. Um, probably Blondie from the, from the dice. Oh, Debbie Harry. Okay. Great show. Yeah, they are. They fine are. wine. Who would you save in a fire? David Moyes or Kevin Keegan? Oh, no, don't do that to me. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, the, the trouble being, I would have probably started the fucking fire. That's the trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Will West Ham finish in the Champions League spots? Um, if we keep losing players like we are, probably not. But it's going to be a great journey finding out. You could take one album to a desert island with you. What would you choose? Rat education. Would you have swapped your football career to have been the lead man, Baz Warren, in the Stranglers? Another tough one. I would probably, probably know, but it's a bloody close call. <laughs> What's the meaning of life, Stuart? Trying your best and having no regrets. And finally... 100 years from now, either Nottingham Forest or Warrington Wolves are erased from history. You have the chance to make sure that one still exists. Who's getting deleted from human memory, Stuart? You can't delete Forest. <laughs> you can't delete Forest. <laughs> you can't delete Forest, my friend. It's in there. It's there. It's in the art. Warrington, delete. <laughs> <laughs> Stuart top man I really appreciate your time mate thank you so much for, for coming on and thanks for everyone for listening to uh, Out of Your League we'll have a new episode for you every week available to download from wherever you get your podcasts uh, you can watch us on YouTube and don't forget to give us a follow at Out of Your RL on Twitter see you next time <laughs> <laughs>